After 2008, I realized that the problems hadn't gone away. The same problems were there, and all the central bank had done was generate more debt. Hey guys, welcome back to Library of Wealth. Today we have Real Vision CEO Raul Pal and Morgan Creek Capital's Mark Yusko talking about the crypto landscape for 2023 and how people are going to survive this transition period in the market. Yusko observes that 2022 was a grand washout for crypto. And what's been interesting, he says, is the price of Bitcoin has held steady, a sign that crypto is not going away. Raul Pal echoes that sentiment, holding an extremely bullish view for 2023. However, he does believe that central banks are continuing to print money to hide their debts, which is causing the massive bubble. Pal and Yusko are watching to see how the market will play out in the next quarter. Let's check out the latest interview with Raul Pal and Mark Yusko. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you enjoy the content we do here on this channel. Let's get right into the video. There is no economic tsunami coming. It's a relentless rising tide. And when you look back, you go, oh my God, it's gone up further and further and further. Everyone waiting for the tsunami, if we didn't get it in March 2020, we're never going to have it at all. So you have to realize that there's something different. So let me put it in perspective for others to understand what this means. A millennial and a boomer, father and son. The father, when he was 30 years old, was probably... It was about 1980, 81. Then they had record low valuations for the stock market, a P of seven. Record high interest rates. So he saved money to stick it in bonds, made 18% or 15%. Record high credit on corporate debt and really cheap property. So the baby boomer had this huge set of opportunities ahead of him. And gold was pretty cheap too, but was going up quite rapidly. So when you look at the percentage of those assets that they could buy with their wages, we get a number. Cut forward to the sum, 32 years old, 2021. They can buy 60% less in property than their parents could for the same median wage. They can buy a lot less of the S&P, a lot less gold. So if, what are those things? Those are assets. The price of milk must be about the same, but it's the assets why assets count is assets are where you save. Those are the things you own that go up in the future and you release the money from, and that's your return on investment. But a young person now can make a lot less investments than their parents could. That is what is going on slowly over time. Your share is becoming less. And that is what's driving the rich-poor divide, because the rich all get access to this free money and can buy more of these assets that go up. The more they go up, the richer they get. The guy on the median income who's 32 years old can't own any of that stuff. It all really started in around 2000 when that bubble popped. The Federal Reserve decided that the only way forward was to use interest rates to drive kind of demand. And it was a massive debt boom that followed. That debt boom, as we know, blew up in 2008. And for many of us in the macro world, that was something that we could see. It was pretty obvious it was going to happen. I was one of the people at the core of that predicting what's going on. And many of the famous people in the big short were kind of subscribers of my research service, The Global Macro Investor. We kind of all knew it was happening, but people in the street didn't. So people would come up to me and say, well, why don't we know? And I realized that that information hadn't really got out there. And I realized that I had access to information other people didn't have, and it wasn't fair. And after Occupy Wall Street, the rise of populism, you knew that, that the power had to be given to the people. The democratization of information was vital. After 2008, I realized that the problems hadn't gone away. The same problems were there, and all the central bank had done was generate more debt by generating lower interest rates, and now they'd started quantitative easing which is basically the printing of money to try and hide those debts. And it became clear to many of us that the next recession was gonna be a big problem. If 2008 was bad, the debt burden was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So something bad was gonna break. The average price of gas that I put in my car was 31 cents. Now, 
I visited my son here over the weekend, and uh, to get a gallon of gas now here is $4.31. It's the same gallon of gas. It does the exact same thing. In fact, arguably it's a little less good because now it has some ethanol in it, so it's not quite as combustible as it used to be. The gas hasn't changed in that 40 years. What's changed is the currency is less valuable. And part of the story of Bitcoin is that as well, is when we talk about Bitcoin, we don't talk about Bitcoin in isolation. We talk about Bitcoin priced in dollars. When we talk about the stock market, we don't talk about the stock market price in isolation. We talk about it priced in dollars. So when the nominal value of something increases, sometimes it's not because the value of that asset is rising. It's that the value of the currency you're denominating it is falling. And so it's that subtle, slow, again, theft. And what's really interesting is it, it's like the, the tail of the boiled frog, right? If you drop a frog in hot water, it will jump right out. But if you put it in cold water and slowly turn up the heat, its muscles will relax to the point was when it gets to the boiling point, it won't be able to jump out. And that's kind of what happens with this slow, insidious devaluation of the currency. So again, the government job is to extract the wealth from the people that create the wealth, the labor, and they do that through this, this tax of inflation. Governments will always profligately spend, right? That's what governments do best, is they spend money. And empires rise, governments become more and more powerful, they become more and more concentrated at the top with their cronies, and then empires get so indebted that they have four choices. They can pay the debt back, they can restructure it, they can default on it, or they can devalue it. Well, they can't pay it back because there's not enough revenues, kind of like today, where we're seeing the budget deficit widen and widen and widen. They could restructure it. Well, who's gonna take the deal? No one, okay? They could default on it. Well, if you do that, then you get kicked out, so they can't do that. So the only choice is to devalue. And when you devalue, eventually you devalue so far that the empire fails. Right? The Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, every empire. And now we're seeing that happen, I believe, in the American Empire, which is causing this great stress on the monetary system, which is what I believe led to the creation of Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency, different from a fiat currency, because a cryptocurrency has a finite supply, different from a fiat currency, which can be created at will. Yusko says that during the collapse in crypto, they chose to push big bets instead of liquefying their assets and waiting for the bull market to begin. Many investors got caught up in the fraudulence and FUD and missed out on big opportunities. With regulatory headwinds still to come in 2023, the outlook for most of the crypto market is still in a state of uncertainty. While Raul has been open on his bullish sentiment for crypto, he acknowledges that the SEC will be playing a major factor. In the past week, Bitcoin has seen a 3% drop in value, leading many to believe that an extended bear market could be in play. As of the recording of this video, Bitcoin is sitting just under 25,600, and the next week will determine if we see a bullish pattern or if we'll enter into a bearish trend that follows back down to 21,000. Yusko still holds strong to his Bitcoin price prediction of $250,000 within the next year, even amid the latest fallout. He believes the market will recover and we'll see massive changes during the coming bull run for crypto. What do you think about the latest interview with Raul Powell and Mark Yusko? And what do you think about the prediction for Bitcoin heading into the second half of June? Comment down below. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This is Library of Wealth. We'll see you in the next video.